is June and I'm an alcoholic. And uh, thank you so much uh, for inviting me to be a part of your evening uh, tonight. And, uh, and thank you so much to those of you who have a service commitment. I've, uh, I've been here a couple of times the, the last few weeks on a Wednesday and, and watched all the work you know, that your, uh, your technology people are doing and that Ali is doing and Teresa is doing. So um, I, I like being a part of such an active, enthusiastic group. So I wanna thank you for allowing me that. Um, you know, I'm actually more nervous than usual because I, um, I do tend to get more nervous about trying to stay on a topic because I really am like one of the dogs in a Disney movie, or if I see a squirrel, I mean, I'm just going to go. So I'll do my best uh, to try and stay on a topic. Um, the most important thing I ever say when I'm asked to participate in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, I want to make sure my timer started, sorry, um, in, you know, in any kind of thing like this capacity, is to let you know that I am not an expert not an expert on alcoholism, on Alcoholics Anonymous, certainly not on the St. Francis Prayer, certainly not on the 11th step, on anything. I'm just a member. I'm going to try and share my experience, strength, and hope. And, you know, in the, um, I love that you guys read the, uh, this is my first time at this group, so uh, on a Tuesday. So I love that you read the um, spiritual experience. I am a person who definitely have had the very, 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 I could go on with a lot more varies, a very slow experience of the educational variety. And, um, you know, one of the things I think Teresa was just reading something and, you know, she said about, you know, um, not, not about me specifically, but about that this is, you know, hopefully a week that helps us get inspired. You know, this, the purpose of this meeting, um, not by me, but to get inspired by whomever is, is coming here to share. And, you know, I, I looked up the word um, inspire uh, a while back and it really means to touch the spirit inside of someone else. And that of course has happened for me countless times uh, in Alcoholics Anonymous. And, um, and it is, is, it's quite an incredible experience to be a part of any part of that. Uh, I, I will be talking about my own opinions, obviously my own experience. Uh, one of the things I love about Alcoholics Anonymous, there's so many things that I love about Alcoholics Anonymous, but one of them for sure is that I can share with you tonight my experiences and my beliefs as much as I can. And the truth is, is that you could hear me speak again in 90 days and I won't even agree with myself anymore. I love that we can change what is no longer working for us. Um, in Alcoholics Anonymous. And that's been incredibly important to me, um, in particular with spirituality. Um, first of all, I know we're here from all different parts of the country. So just for the, uh, and you know, different countries uh, as well. So just for the sake of whatever your tradition is, I will tell you that my sobriety date is 13th of July, 1972. That means I have been continually sober one day at a time for 48 and a half years. Um, and it means that for me, it is the only thing that I have done 100% perfectly for 48 and a half years is I haven't taken anything that affects me from the neck up, which is how I personally uh, define sobriety. Um, the other thing that I have done very close to perfectly in this 48 and a half years is I have kept my commitments in Alcoholics Anonymous, whether I wanted to or not, whether I believed they would make a difference or not whether I liked anybody at the meeting or not. You know, I heard someone in Texas once say, you know, if you like everyone in AA, you're probably not going to enough meetings. And, and I think that that could be true. So, you know, there's a few things that I want to go ahead and, and share about with respect to my spiritual journey and a little bit about the St. Francis prayer. Um, and, um, but I also do feel very, that it's very important anytime we share in a meeting um, that we give a little bit of, you know, where we came from um, and, and how I ended up getting here needing to have uh, a spiritual awakening um, of the educational variety in my case. So um, I didn't drink for as long as probably most of the people um, on this meeting or in many other meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous um, that I've been to over the years that I've been sober. And I'm very grateful that, you know, when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, they just said, if alcohol and what's happening with you is destroying any part of your life, you don't have to go any farther. 
Now, there were certainly some people when I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, chronologically, I was 13 years old. Um, and I have been continually sober since I was 13. But I felt 2000 when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. And, you know, when we talk about um, our attitude and our outlook upon life changing, I think it's absolutely phenomenal that I am here 48 years later and I feel younger than I did when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. I mean, that's a pretty incredible gift. And I don't even know exactly how that came about, really. Um, can't tell you exactly when that day happened. But the thing is, is that um, I came to Alcoholics Anonymous completely broken in every way, as broken as I could possibly have been. I hated everything about myself. I had always hated everything about myself. And the only thing uh, that helped me get through all of the self-disgust and hatred that I had always felt, which got worse as I continued to drink and experience different types of pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. The only thing that got me through that was alcohol. I needed a way out and alcohol and the other things that I mixed with it gave me that until it didn't anymore. And then I found myself with alcohol not working. I was as drunk as I had ever been. I couldn't even get up off the floor, but it wasn't shutting off the feelings. And uh, for me, that, that, was, that was that jumping off place, you know, um, where I couldn't go on living the way that I was living. And I could not imagine how I was gonna go on without alcohol. And so when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I really didn't know if I wanted what you had I did not understand what you had here. And I didn't believe it was possible for someone like me to have it anyway, to the extent that I did see what you had. But I sure knew I didn't want what I had anymore. And uh, I love in Alcoholics Anonymous that you don't have to believe in anything about Alcoholics Anonymous for it to work. If you do what we do, things will change. I certainly can't predict exactly how that will come about for any individual. I certainly haven't known it, you know, for myself. Um, it's interesting because, you know, over the years, I will tell you that I have known many, many members of Alcoholics Anonymous who have come to Alcoholics Anonymous, perhaps never believing anything, or perhaps having had a belief, and then um, come to Alcoholics Anonymous and, and maybe developed a new belief. And in the years that they have stayed sober as they have done this 12 step work, uh, you know, going through the 12 steps and applying the principles of the traditions and all of that in their life, their conscious contact has gotten stronger and their faith has gotten deeper. And it is truly something that I have watched and experienced other people having. And to a certain extent, I have experienced it also at times in the years that I have been sober. But I have to tell you that I am not, uh, it has not been like a tiny thread that I came here with and today it's this big thick rope that I can rely on all the time. Even though I know that that exists for many, many people. I am a doubter, I'm a skeptic, I'm a cynic. I'm still always questioning. Um, I don't know why that is, but it is the way that I am. and. I have often in the years that I have been sober um, felt worried, you know, about my um, ability in Alcoholics Anonymous uh, to share honestly um, without being blasphemous or discouraging to someone else. Because I do know that people have had many different types of conscious contacts. And I have had that too at different times. And then things have changed. Um, and I haven't really liked it uh, when they have changed sometimes. It's been scary or painful. And it was funny, you know, um, all these years, I would uh, have told you, I would not have ever described myself as a person of faith in the 48 years that I've been sober. I just don't really think of myself as that kind of person. But I'm thinking, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago, you know, I happened to look up faith in the dictionary one day, and it said something like one of the definitions was, taking actions that you don't believe in. And I thought, oh my goodness, I'm an incredible person of faith because I've been taking these actions all of these years, you know? Um, and so I wanna share with you before I get to the, uh, talking a little bit about the um, St. Francis prayer, I wanna share with you a few stories or things that have helped me 
um, the most because I am a story person. Um, unfortunately, uh, that's just the way that my brain works. You know, I don't always remember a page in the big book, um, but I can remember a story, you know, that someone has shared. And one of my dearest friends, a guy that I got sober with, and I know there's, uh, I know Gary and Tracy are here and a number of other people that knew Howard Polance, um, who passed away. We got sober together in 1972. And Howard shared, um, he was a, a scientist. He really was, you know, like a rocket scientist. Um, and he had his own struggles and whatever. And he came to find his own higher power that, you know, that worked amazingly for him. But one of the things that Howard would say is he would say, you know, if you find something in your life that makes you feel or think of God or a power greater than yourself or something spiritual or something in your heart that makes you go, wow, which is how I feel when I see the ocean or a dolphin, this is me. You know, I'm from California. You're probably expecting me to be kind of new age. So there it is. But when you find that, mark that spot, Howard would say and visit it often. And these are the kind of things that have been very gently suggested to me in Alcoholics Anonymous over the years. The most important story that anyone ever shared for me, and I heard it in my early years of sobriety, and I always try to mention it when I'm asked to talk about the 11th step. Um, when I got sober, there was a woman named Sybil Corwin um, who was the first woman to get sober west of the Mississippi. She got sober in 1941 when AA was only six years old. Um, she married a man. Well, she actually, when you, if you ever hear Sybil's talk, she married a lot of men, but, um, you know, she gives a really long, her name takes longer than some people's, you know, drunk -a -log. But anyway, the last person that she married was a wonderful guy named Bob Corwin. And Bob was a guy who was in and out of Alcoholics Anonymous for over 10 years. Um, really struggling because he did believe and feel that he was an atheist and he really had some problems with accepting some of the ideas and the principles in our steps and our literature. And eventually Bob got sober and he stayed sober and he always did consider himself an atheist or an agnostic in all the years. He died with 58 years of continuous sobriety. One night he was at a meeting and he'd been sober quite a while. Um, I think he said he'd been sober 10 years. And that means he'd gone to AA for 10 years and then he was sober 10 years. So this is 20 years of going to meetings. So I don't know exactly how many times, but let's just assume thousands of times he had heard chapter five, um, as have many of us who have stayed sober. And I'm sure that you are all better people than I, but I have to admit that I frequently zone out during chapter five, you know, um, during the meeting. And, you know, cause I just can't stay focused all the time at every meeting. So Bob was in a meeting about 10 years sober and he saw this young woman was reading chapter five and right near the end, she began to sob, not just cry with like a cute little tear running down her cheek, but to literally sob and like lose her breath. She could hardly speak. And if you've ever been in a meeting where someone is kind of losing it that way, we all kind of, you can almost feel the energy in the room as everybody just kind of roots for them to just get through it. You know, and so he really focused on this young woman who was trying to read, and she was like, hey, B, and C, God could and would if he were sought. And Bob said that that night was the first time he ever heard it say, God could and would if he were sought. All the years before that, Bob always heard it say, it doesn't mean anybody read it that way. It was just the way he heard it. It always said to him, God couldn't would if he were found. And that night when he heard God couldn't would if he were sought, he thought maybe the closest I'll ever come to having some kind of a spiritual experience will be in the seeking. And that has comforted me tremendously throughout the years as I have had my moments of doubt or my periods of rebellion um, or, you know, whatever it might be. And I have um, opened up, you know, my life and my heart um, on a spiritual basis in a number of different ways. And some of them might work for, for some of you and some of them have worked for me and then they didn't for a while. Um, and it's important for me uh, to have a sense of humor and it's important for me to be open-minded. Uh, and I need to be reminded of that. It's one of the reasons that going to meetings and talking and sharing with people is important, you know, for me um, in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, there's a wisdom teacher, and I was reading a story about this um, 
And it, like, I like like two or three paragraph stories. That's kind of the way that, you know, my head works and it stays with me. So there was this wisdom teacher and he was teaching a bunch of disciples and they kept asking him, how am I going to know when I'm enlightened? How am I going to know when I'm enlightened? And he goes, all right, all right, stop with the question. And he passed out a piece of paper to everybody in the room and he gave him a piece of paper and he gave him a pencil. And he said, all right, I want you each to write down the exact dimensions of the room that you're in right now write it down the exact dimensions. And so they, he gave them 15 minutes and they all, you know, wrote things down and, you know, whatever. And then they all turned in their answer. You know, the room is 12 feet tall and this is the small is seven. And they wrote, and some people did more detail and some people did more, you know, and they all turned it in and he looked at them and he goes, you're all wrong. He goes, the answer is, I don't know. And that was really comforting, you know, to me. Um, the idea that this is a mystery um, is exciting and it works well in my heart. Um, again, that doesn't mean that it's the right thing, you know, for anyone else. But I do know that through showing up in Alcoholics Anonymous and not drinking no matter what, that I have tried to work these steps to the best of my ability. And that as I have stayed sober, I have tried again. And as I have stayed sober, I have tried again. And I am still trying. And I'm having an individual experience. You know, there's a line in our book, this is an experience you must not miss. But this is an experience. It's not something that you can just talk about. I don't think it's something you can just read about. It must be experienced. You know, there's a, uh, a, a I'm told that there's a treatment program in Minnesota that promises people the equivalent of a year of sobriety in 30 days. And that's kind of what everybody I've ever known that comes to AA, we want, you know, we want 30, we want a year of sobriety in 30 days, you know, but to get a year of sobriety, it takes a year. And um, there is something though, you know, uh, one of the old timers one time uh, at my group, he was at, he was sharing at a meeting and, uh, and he shared for us that my home group is the Back Porch International. And there's a lot of, uh, members of my home group that have uh, come out here tonight to support me, even though they could give my talk, but I really appreciate that. But um, Bud came and shared and he's 93 years old and uh, Bud had uh, 30 years. He was at a meeting and he was talking to a new guy and, uh, and the new guy said, how long have you been sober? And Bud said, 30 years. And he said to the newer guy, he goes, how long have you been sober? And the newer guy said, 90 days. And Bud said, you know, 90 days is longer than 30 years when you're doing that first 90 days, you know, those 30 years, you know, they start coming a lot faster, but man, those first 90 days, it's a long, long, long 90 days uh, for a lot of us, you know. Um, so one of the things, you know, is that I tend to be very rigid. I don't know that I'm rigid. I don't think I'm rigid because I think I'm not, I mean, who thinks I'm rigid, you know, but I am rigid and I have to be, it has to be pointed out. I have to see it sometimes. And so I was reading this book and um, I just want to tell you this little story because this was so, this is so right for me. Um, it's a book and I, it's called, I'm going to get the name a little bit wrong, but some, some of you, I know there was a movie made too, but it's like eat, pray, love or something, you know, or eat, love, pray, you know, whichever. So Anyway, there's this part in this book where this woman goes to India and she goes to an ashram because she really wants to learn how to meditate. I mean, she really does. It's really important. She really wants to make this, you know, dedicated. And while she's there, someone tells the story. And the story that they tell is that there was once an, at this ashram, a very famous meditation teacher. And he would try, everyone would gather for meditation and he would be teaching and leading them in a meditation. But he had a cat. And, you know, any of us who have a cat, I happen to have them. I have to lock them out of the room when I do Zoom because they like to be on the screen. Um, so um, anyway, he, he found that this cat was very annoying and it was distracting the people who were trying to meditate. So it became a routine before he would teach this class that someone would tie the cat, not in a painful, dangerous way. It was a loving way that the cat had its little cushion and it was tied there just during class so that it wouldn't go around and disturb everyone as they were trying to really concentrate and meditate. And then one day the cat died and no one could meditate. Now, I don't know if you're getting the story here, but the idea was that it became such a routine that someone had to tie the cat that then all of a sudden when there wasn't a cat, 
they thought they couldn't go forward. You know, this is the way that I can be sometimes with my prayer and meditation. I'm going to do my meditation at seven. I'm going to do it at 6.30. I'm going to do it at 6.30 before anybody gets up. I'm going to do it at 6.30. Okay. I get over there and the matches are not working. I don't know why the matches are not working. I want to light my candle because I'm going to meditate with the candle because this is the way I'm going to meditate. The, can the matches are not working. You know, now it's 7.30 and one of the cats have thrown up. Now I have to clean that. I can't meditate when a cat has thrown up. So now I have to go clean and polish and do all this. Now it's 6.45. Well, my whole meditation has been, it has been ruined. Do you know what I mean? I mean, it's like, you know, so this is the part where I start to see that I, I'm so rigid that if I didn't meditate at exactly 6.30 with exactly the candle that I wanted, you know, that I, that it's all for naught. Well, that's, that's not true. One of the things we learn, hopefully, as we stay sober is that we can start our day over, that it's okay to meditate at 6.47 instead of 6.30. 30 exactly that it doesn't mean you know and so these kind of things where I've had to you know to lighten up one of the things that I um I happen to be fascinated with science and the brain and I don't know exactly why um probably because I only went to seventh grade I went to traditional school only up to seventh grade so I've never had a science class in my life um but one time I was in the doctor's office reading an article and I think it was scientific America um, and I really was like, it was the only thing in there, or I would never have picked it up because it would terrify me. But it actually was an article that was easy enough that I could understand parts of it. And I'm going to get things wrong. So again, please remember, I'm sharing a story and how it helped me. I don't have all the details right. I'm not a scientist. I know that, you know, I'm, I mean, I've got that. But so what it said was in this article that they had studied, scientists are able to study famous meditators. So for example, they can study the Dalai Lama's brain and they attach little things to the Dalai Lama's brain or other people who are world famous wisdom teachers and meditators. When they attach these things to their brain, scientists can measure the amount of blue that they see. And these world famous meditators have blue that is beyond anything that most of us could even possibly imagine. There is so much blue, it's absolutely incredible. But what they found is that people who associate with these world famous meditators, even if they don't themselves meditate regularly, they get more blue in their brain. And I believe that that's one of the things that happens for me in Alcoholics Anonymous is that as I interact with other people in Alcoholics Anonymous and as I share and ask them a little bit about their spiritual experiences and things that have worked or you know are, are working now, I get more blue. And there are days when I have more blue that I can share. And then there are days where I'm, you know, pretty much blueless, as we might say, you know, and so I need your blue. And this is something that I get as I attend meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous, as I attend conferences, as I stay in touch, you know, by phone or by Zoom or whatever it is, um, because I do think that this is very much, you know, a shared experience. Um, when I thought of the St. Francis prayer, I didn't want to just give, uh, you know, one line because I really didn't think, I, I don't think even I, I don't think anybody, but I certainly can't talk for 40 minutes about one line, you know, of anything. Um, but there are a couple of lines in the St. Francis prayer that are regularly important for me. Um, and that's part of what, you know, what I wanted to share a little bit about. So one of those, it has to do with where there is discord that I might bring harmony. I am a person who, before I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, and for a number of years after I was sober in Alcoholics Anonymous, I was so racked with self-pity that I could truly, you know, ruin an entire AA birthday party just by sighing loudly and looking really sad. And if you happen to ask, I could then share things that would make everyone feel just a little sad. And I didn't know that that was a character defect. I just felt that I justifiably, as a victim of life and its circumstances, had been so damaged that there was no one in the world who had ever, ever suffered as much as I had. Thankfully, one of the great gifts 
in Alcoholics Anonymous is that I've been able to see that although I have had some incredibly traumatic and painful experiences in my life before getting sober, and in fact, since getting sober, I have actually been far overpaid. And I have watched people in Alcoholics Anonymous walk, walk through experiences that I hope I do not ever get anywhere near having. And I have watched them do it sober with dignity and a sense of humor. Um, so that the amount of gratitude that I feel seems to increase every single year You know that I am sober. When I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, I felt so sorry for myself that I had to get sober at 13, feeling like 2000, knowing that there would never be anything good in my life again. And it had always been so bad already. And now I was just going to have to go to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous day in and day out for the rest of my long life. And, you know, people would sometimes say things. They're like, wow, you got sober so young. You know, you might have, you know, you could have 40 years. I'm like, Ugh. when you're new and your life is not going well, you really don't want 40 years. I mean, honest to God, when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, if they could have promised me that if I drank, I would have died, I would have gone out and drank. I wanted to die. You know, I really did. I needed to die. I just couldn't die. I tried to die before I got here as often as I could. I tried to put myself in a position where someone else would take my life. I tried to take my own life because life hurts so much, you know, um, and I needed that way out that only alcohol gave me. And you can't stay drunk 24 hours a day, no matter how hard you try, you know? So I would have those periods of waking up and being ashamed and being, you know, and just hating everything about myself and thinking this is going to go on for a long, long time. And thankfully, that is one of the things that the old timers were able to convince me by talking to me about, you know, the doctor's opinion, by talking to me about the fact that this is a disease that gets worse, never better, that this is a progressive disease that gets worse even when we stay sober. And those of us on this call who have stayed sober have watched people go back out and drink. And it's unbelievable. I mean, you would think it was like an exaggerated Steven Spielberg script sometimes, how quickly alcoholism destroys their life. I've seen it happen in a weekend. And you just, you know, it's, you can't believe that it can do that. But the truth is, is that that is exactly what happens. Not for every single person, in exactly that dramatic way. But I actually, you know, what kept me sober in those early days was not the thought that if I went out and drank, I was going to die. It was the thought that I will be able to go out there and live for another 20 or 30 or 40 years the way that I was living. And I already hated myself so much that I was nauseous all the time. I thought, how could this, how could this go on for another 20 or 30 years? So coming back to the fact that I was, um, you know, there's a, a movie um, that I that I sometimes talk about where this mother and daughter change places, but the teenage daughter and the mom are having an argument, you know, in the beginning of the movie and the, the daughter says to her mom, she goes, you're a fun sucker. You suck all the fun out of everything. And so I came to Alcoholics Anonymous as a huge fun sucker. And I had been a fun sucker before I got sober and I stayed doing that for a while. Um, and so for me, one of the things that I think a lot about when I think about the St. Francis prayer is that I want to add something. I want to add something good. I have a karmic debt to the universe for all of the fun sucking, you know, that I did over the years, for all of the infliction of self-pity, for all of the darkness that I shared. And so when I think of the St. Francis prayer, two of the lines that mean the most to me and that I really try, I think about them so often, I don't know, almost daily, I think, is that, you know, I want to, where there's darkness, I want to bring light. I want to bring something that's going to, you know, to help. And, um, and, you know, boy, you know, in this last year, you know, there's been a lot of sadness and darkness that has happened for a lot of people. And it's not all just because um, we're having, uh, you know, the, the virus and, and we're all, you know, stuck in our house or we can't do regular things. That is one thing. Um, and it's very hard on a lot of us in different times. I mean, you know, if I wake up and I think we're going to do this, you know, the other day I sent a text on, uh, do we, you know, that I dictated to a friend right around New Year's Eve. And I said, happy new year. Hope to see you this, hope to see you in 2021. And Siri wrote, happy new year. Hope to see you in 2025. 
And I thought, I hope she doesn't know something that I don't know because that is like more than I could possibly stand. But the thing is, is that I thought, you know, I have to do this sometimes an hour at a time. You know, I can't think about doing this for too long. You know, it's just very much like when I got sober. Sometimes I can only do the pandemic and not seeing my kids or my family on a regular basis, you know, just a little at a time sometimes. Um, but in this format, as we have been, you know, going online with Alcoholics Anonymous, which has been like an incredible experience that has added spiritually to my life more than I could possibly describe. But as we've had this, there have been things that are going on. You know, we've had a couple of old timers in our neighborhood who have lost their spouse, um, you know, after a long marriage and not because of the virus, but, you know, just for whatever reason. And we can't go over and sit with them the way that we normally would. And we can't bring them food the way that we normally would. Um, and, and there are a lot of people, you know, that have, uh, I, there's a few of them on here now, but there's a lot of people that we've known over this time who've had someone that they love have to be in the hospital, you know? And again, not necessarily the virus, could be whatever it is. But normally what we do for our loved ones, you know, in and out of AA is we show up. And we are there and we try and bring some kind of kindness or flowers or, you know, whatever it is. And we can't do that. Most of us are, you know, we sit out in the car in the parking lot at the hospital. We can't even go in, you know. Um, and so looking for ways that I can bring light, you know, sometimes, you know, I found it to be videos, you know, of kittens, you know, um, that I send people, you know, or, um, you know, or a silly joke or, you know, a picture of a rainbow you know, that we don't have that much rain in Southern California, but every once in a while, we got a really nice picture of a rainbow a few months ago. And, you know, about a month ago, my husband got a dolphin actually jumping out, you know, above the wave. And I sent that to a bunch of people who probably didn't really care. It might not have meant that much to them, but I was trying, you know what I mean? I'm trying to bring a little bit of light to make someone smile, you know, at that particular moment. And, um, the other line that I think about so much is to try and bring harmony, you know, where there is discord. And sometimes that's within my group, you know, um, because, you know, I'm like anybody else. I could call and complain about some people in my group to other members of my group. And, you know, and I could cause discord. And I know that because I've done it. You know, thankfully, I'm, I don't do that now. You know, I am really aware of that. And I, that's not what I want to bring. I don't want to bring that, you know, to my group. I have three daughters. I'm an only child and I grew up in a lot of foster homes. Um, and so I, you know, I really didn't know this whole thing about, you know, how being a mom um, and, and, and with the three daughters, they, you know, they, they argue. I mean, I, I know you guys may not be that surprised at this, but you know, they, they argue and they disagree. And, you know, as a mom, I mean, I'd like, them to, I want everybody to get along and I want everybody to be kind and, you know, whatever, but I have come to see that sometimes they call me to complain about what she did or she said, just like sponsees. And I have to be very careful about where I go on this because I can create discord or I can try, you know, usually with just being silent is, you know, the best thing or mostly silent um, to try and promote harmony, you know, and I can't make harmony because you can't force harmony because then it's not harmony you know, but I can try and add, you know, to that and to try and be aware, you know, of that. And, you know, I'm looking at Lynn from my home group right now. And she was talking, you know, um, a few months ago or whatever, we talked together at a conference and, uh, and she was sharing about how she has a basket, you know, outside her door when people are working at her house. And uh, it's like just a basket of snacks, you know, basket of treats, you know, there's nothing in the big book, you know, about the basket of treats. Um, but it's a way that we give back, you know, to people who we come in contact with so that we can bring some light, you know, um, sometimes, you know, if you're working at somebody's house and you're hungry, having a little snack can help you be more of service in what you're doing, you know, um, and that can help them, you know, be more of service. And it's just kind of a, a, a thing that I believe is constantly happening. Um, and, and that is important, you know, for me um, to be a part of that. And I'm looking at my timer. Um, okay, so I'm gonna tell you this one other little uh, story and then I'll, I'll stop and then we'll see how it goes here. Um, when, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the history of AA, don't panic. Um, Cause I know, you know, as soon as you say history, everybody goes, oh my gosh, you know, I gotta, I gotta leave now. But so 
before Dr. Bob and Bill Wilson ever met, there was a guy named Roland. And Roland came from an incredibly wealthy family. I've actually been to the town that Roland was from. And even though I knew that he was from, that he was from a very wealthy family, even I was like completely amazed at like how wealthy this was like a town, not just like a building or a high, I mean, it's a town that he, he, his family owned and he was a drunk. And this was a huge disappointment to his incredibly prominent family. Uh, and so they sent him to see the greatest mind of the time, a man named Dr. Young. And he spent a year with Dr. Young who tried to help him with his drinking problem and his other problems. And, you know, Roland kind of got everything worked out and he left. And within a few days, I can't remember, actually, it might be hours, but definitely within a few days, Roland was drunk. I mean, Roland couldn't believe it. He'd done all this work to not drink and he was already drunk. I mean, he wasn't even home yet. And so he turned right around and he went back to see Dr. Young and he said, I, you know, I can't, I, I drank. And Dr. Young said, oh, you know, I'm paraphrasing again, you know, I'm not quoting, uh, but Dr. Young said, I, you know, I'm so sorry. He goes, you know, I was afraid of this. I was afraid that you were hopeless. And uh, now I know that you really are. And Dr. And, you know, and Roland's like, well, wait a minute. I mean, hopeless, you know, there's like a lot, there's not a lot of good spin you can put on hopeless. That seems pretty strong. And so, you know, Roland was saying, well, we don't hopeless. And he said, yeah, he said, I, I was trying to help you have a change, a psychic change, have some kind of a transformation so that you could not drink anymore because that's the only thing that I've ever known to work for a person who drinks the way that you do, who is an alcoholic you know, of, of the type that you are. And he said, I've been trying to help you effect that change. I did everything I could, but obviously I've failed. Um, but the only thing that I know that can work for someone like you is to have a psychic change or to have a spiritual experience, a spiritual awakening. And Roland goes, well, wait a minute. He goes, you know, I belong to a church. He goes, you know, my family built the church. He goes, I actually carved the altar. You know, I mean, I'm involved in the church. And Dr. Young shook his head and he said, yeah, that's, that's not quite it. It's not just that. It's not just being a member of a church. It has to be this psychic change that transforms your entire outlook and the way that you see and look at things. You know, and that's what I tried to cause, but it hasn't worked. So later on, Roland goes on and meets Ebby, and they pass on this message eventually to Bill Wilson, um, who is one of our co-founders. And that's the spiritual experience that, that, you know, about it, you know, that Linda kind of read the capsulation of tonight. Um, 15 years after Alcoholics Anonymous existed, Bill Wilson wrote a letter to Dr. Young. And he said, I don't know if you know what an important contribution you made to Alcoholics Anonymous. We now have thousands of people who are sober, thousands of people who are members of their family in good standing, who are members of the community, um, who have had this educational variety or sometimes a very, you know, a, a huge, you know, spiritual experience. But whichever it is, your definition of the fact that we had to have a psychic change, that we had to have a spiritual experience. This is one of the foundations of this whole program. And you made a huge contribution. And Dr. Young wrote back to Bill. And he said, I did not know that I had made a contribution. I often wondered, you know, what had happened with Roland. And I'm, you know, so happy to know that I have made a difference. You know, what a wonderful thing to make a difference. And he said, but I want to tell you that in my experience, he said, I have found that it's not enough that a person has this psychic change, that unless they remain active in a community, that they will not be able to maintain all of the benefits of this psychic change. And that, I believe, is one of the reasons why it is so important that we continue to stay and remain active members of Alcoholics Anonymous, remembering that it always comes back, in my opinion, to one alcoholic talking to another for fun and for free. Thanks for letting me be part of your meeting tonight.